this video, we're going to quickly summarize videos SP 3.1 to SP 3.7. Remember, that's the third context point of the Search for Better Health module. So these are the actual top points. This is a syllabus link directly here. So what I'll do, I'll actually cover the verbs, the, the ones here, and link those verbs to content needs to know, and, and basically go through each of those top points in terms of what needs to know in a bit more detail. You can just jump to any part here as well if you want to. They'll just jump to that actual section of the video that covers that top point and that will remain open for the rest of the video. Uh, so first is describe the contributions. In this case, describe which means provide features and characteristics of the contributions of Pascha and Koch to understanding of the infectious disease. So got Louis Pascha, what he did is he basically found out the role of microbes in decay. He did so by observing spoiled beer, and then he did some experiments um, to disprove spontaneous gen generation as a result of his observation, earlier observations. And all of this uh, disproving of spontaneous generation led to the new germ theory, which basically said that microbes cause disease and spoilage. And that helped, after people realized that microbes cause disease, he also helped develop techniques to sterilize equipment and also developed the pasteurization technique to help kill off those pathogens that he knew now cause disease. And that saves lots of lives. He also worked on vaccines, and these vaccines were then used to produce first immunity. And he was an earlier developer of those vaccines. So these were some of his actual contributions towards um, our understanding of infectious disease. And in terms of Robert Koch, his main one was he came up with a technique to actually link a specific pathogen to a named disease. Because while Louis Pasch helped, helped us understand that overall microbes cause disease, we didn't have any way yet to link one specific one to one specific disease. And that's where Koch's posh test came to play. These were these four steps here he developed. So if, for example, he wanted to find out that bacteria, if bacteria X causes anthrax, the disease anthrax, he had to get a disease sheep, which is meant to be this one here, take his blood and, and find the bacteria X in the blood of that sheep. Then he needed to put the, those actual uh, bacteria X in a agar plate and try to colonize it, which means, or culture it, which means grow it on a plate. That was, if it could grow on the plate, that means move to a third step. Now he needed to take a healthy sheep and inject the actual bacteria X into healthy sheep. And if that sheep became sick, that means the next step is correct. And the last step was to take blood from that newly sick animal and it also had to have that bacteria X in his blood. If all these four steps were basically shown correct and the experiment over and over again, then we could link a certain bacteria or a certain pathogen to a certain disease. And what he also did at Robert Koch was he developed the agar plate technique to allow us to get a better understanding of infectious disease by growing them in culture. Uh, so this is Lois Pasch and Robert Koch and their contributions to uh, our understanding of disease. Basically without them we would have no or very little understanding of disease. Then the next one was perform an investigation to model Pasch's experiment to identify the role of microbes in decay. So this was the actual experiment he did to disprove spontane spontaneous generation. It says perform an investigation. That means we need to know the steps of step-by-step -step procedure of that experiment and the setup as well. And it also means we need to know the safety precautions. And the actual top one says identify the role, or which means name or recognize the role of microbes in decay. So the experiment he did was he had two conical flasks, which he filled with beef broth, which is basically food for the bacteria. He put two different types of stoppers on them, one with a open stopper, which is open to the air itself. The other one with an S-shaped one which was not open to the air, so things would have gotten stuck. And he put them on a heating plate, some kind of heating device, and left to pasteurize, basically to make sure there's no microbes in there to begin with. Then he left it standing in a warm area for a period of time, and then he recorded any changes. And the changes that were recorded were that this broth turned really kind of disgustingly cloudy, and the other broth was not affected at all. And that disproved spontaneous generation because if spontaneous generation would have assumed that both of them would have become frothy and cloudy, whereas only the one that was open to the environment became cloudy because the actual microbes that came into the air were responsible for making that decay happen. So that was the whole idea of the experiment. And you need to know the actual um, equipment and procedure, right? So you use two conical flasks, a certain amount of beef broth, you had the S-shape and the straight stopper, and also that heating equipment, no other procedure, and also the safety concerns. So for example, you could burn yourself whilst trying to pasteurize the water. You have to handle that glass with care because uh, glass can be painful. Right? 
when it's broken. Right? So these would be some of the safety concerns. That was the experiment. The next one was distinguish between, and distinguish means tell the difference. So you need to be able to tell the difference between prions, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, fungi, and macroparasites, and name one disease caused by each type of pathogen. So in this case, what you basically need to know is you need to know the unique characteristics of each type of pathogen and how you can differentiate between different types of pathogens. For example, the overall classification of pathogens, there's two types, microscopic and macroscopic. The macroscopic ones are the macroparasites, and they can either live in, or in us, which are the endoparasites, or they live on us, which are the ectoparasites. Examples would be obviously ticks live on us and taper, taperworms live in us. The microscopic ones are ones which are invisible, there are the non-cellular ones that are not made out of cells, and there are cellular ones. Non-cellular ones are, for example, prions, which are made of only proteins, and viruses, which are basically a protein code and DNA inside of it. And then we've got the cellular ones, which are, for example, your bacteria, which are prokaryotic, or your protozoa and fungi, which are eukaryotic. But protozoa are always unicellular, whereas fungi can be unicellular, but are often multicellular. Right, so these are some differences already, but you should know kind of this table. But for example, we have the actual pathogens up on top, and on the side we have different types of features. Cellular, prions are non-cellular because they're protein. Viruses are also non-cellular because they just have a protein code with DNA inside of it. Bacteria are unicellular and prokaryotic, so they are cellular. And protozoa are unicellular eukaryotic. Fungi are unicellular, but it can also be multicellular eukaryotic, whereas macroparasites are always multi-eukaryotic. I see there's some other ways you can differentiate between them. Microscopic. All the first five are all microscopic, except for macroparasites. Um, genetic information, prions are just proteins, so they have no genetic information. Viruses can have DNA or RNA, whereas all the other ones just have DNA. Prions, viruses, protozoa, and macroparasites have no cell wall, whereas bacteria have a cell wall, but the cell wall is made of murine, whereas fungi have a cell wall, which is made of chitin. And then we have the disease caused by each, basically the macaw disease caused by prions, AIDS caused by virus, tetanus caused by bacteria, Prozoa causes malaria, fungi causes after its foot, and macroparasites cause, uh, tapeworm causes um, tapeworm disease, which is an example of macroparasite. Right, so in this top point, you need to know, be able to tell the difference, and some of these features should help you tell the difference between them. The next one is you need to be able to gather, process information, so you need to collect information, and you need to be able to evaluate, validate the information, if it's reliable or not. And what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to trace the understanding of our of the development of the uh, cause and prevention of malaria. So how has our cause, our understanding of the cause and prevention of malaria changed over time? Trace means we need to be able to, be able to follow that change. So first of all, we should know that early on, basically, we had no understanding of the cause of disease. All we knew was the symptoms. We knew what kind of symptoms people had that had malaria. And we knew that for more than 3,000 years. We knew that the fever and the chills were two symptoms of malaria. We didn't know what caused it. So all we could do in terms of prevention was focus on treating symptoms, for example, using herbs, which the Chinese have done about 300 BC. And also, we believe that bad air was actually the cause, but poor understanding. So we removed swamps at, to remove that bad air, and that helped somewhat because with swamps we removed mosquitoes, but that had nothing to do with the bad air itself. But once we could, once two people come, came along, first Charles Laveron in 1880. So this is when most of that change happened in 1880. Charles Laveron proved that discovered the plasmodium, then the plasmodium caused the disease, so now we discovered the cause in 1880, and then transmission was discovered in 1887 by Ronald Ross, he discovered that it was transmitted by a mosquito, and then Giovanni Grassi came a bit afterwards and proved that the mosquito was a vector and responsible for transmission. Right, so after in, uh, 1880s we had a cause and transmission, so once 1880 was passed, basically we had much more ways of being able to uh, destroy and prevent malaria because we knew more about it. So. First, we knew to remove the vector, the mosquito, and we did so by draining swarms, using pesticides, and wearing protective clothing. And that was quite successful, but the only problem is we started to use heavily these anti-malarial drugs to fight the actual plasmodium, and also we used pesticides to kill off the mosquito. The only problem was that resistance developed eventually, which meant that less and less of them became effective, so we needed to think of new ways to try to fight the disease. And what we're doing at the moment is trying to develop a malaria vaccine. Done started doing that in 1981, and we have we're still doing that now because we, they're not effective as as of yet. Right? So basically, you need to know kind of the timeline in terms of how our understanding of the cause and prevention of malaria has changed over time, and you might be given questions related to that.
Right, then we have this one, which is just identify data sources, gather personal information from secondary sources to describe one name, infectious disease in terms of its cause, transmission, host response, major symptoms, treatment, prevention, and control. So, I got gather, process, and, and analyze just means collect and um, make sure that information is correct and then make, conne make connections between information you've gathered and the dot point. But then describe means provide characteristics and features. So we need to provide characteristics and features of the cause. The cause is by well, obviously a pathogen and this pathogen in this case would be the influenza virus. The transmission is how it gets to a person. So the flu virus gets to a person by the air or by contaminated food or by direct contact. The host response, so what happens in our body, our body fights the infection both through specific means and non-specific means. Lymphocytes and the specific immune response will be specific means and information response will be what our body does in terms of non-specific responses. And then the major symptoms, so how you feel like when you have the actual um, disease. You have fever, headache, chills, vomiting, and dizziness. Uh, treatment, so what's your, what, what do you do once you have it? You get as much best stress as you, as you can. You can take aspirin, but they don't kill the, the virus. They just treat the symptoms. Prevention, so what, what do you do to make sure you, that you don't get in the first place? First of all, get plenty of sleep and exercise because that makes your immune system stronger. And also stay away from infected people because you have less chance of getting infections if you stay away from those infected people. So what is control? So control means what do you make sure if a person has it, what do you make sure he doesn't spread it? Uh, just basically quarantine that infected person. So make sure he stays at home because that means the disease is more or less controlled. All right, next one is Identify the role of antibiotics in the management of infectious disease. Identify just means name, recognize the role. So we need to talk about the fact that these antibiotics, what they do is they help treat bacterial infections. Right? So that they treat infectious diseases caused by bacteria. They do so by targeting the cell wall of bacteria. And by doing, doing so by targeting the cell wall, either directly kills that actual bacteria or prevents the reproduction of that bacteria. Um, so yeah, it's just used to treat bacterial infections, and that bacterial is important. Antibiotics only get used to treat bacteria infections. The last one says process information from second sources to discuss problems relating to antibiotic resistance. Discuss in this case means we need to discuss problems, so we need to identify the problems and then provide arguments for and or against. And all I'm going to do is provide four arguments for that problem that I've identified. So first, you need to know what antibiotic resistance is. The idea is just basically that you have variation within any population, which means these bacteria will have some bacteria which are very resistant, which is the red ones, and some which are not resistant. So if we use antibiotics, the ones which are not resistant will basically die off because they can't resist the antibiotics. And that leaves us only the ones which are resistant, right? and thereby we have way too many and that are resistant, which means we have a problem now. And the problem we have now is that the overprescription and use of antibiotics is causing antibiotic resistance. That's our problem that I've identified. Now I'm giving you an argument for the fact that this is a problem because if they are being overprescribed and we have antibiotic resistance being developed, that means that these antibiotics become less effective. Right? So this is our argument for problem one. Another problem is if they do become less effective, what that means is we have a problem. And arguments for it, this being a problem is that if they do become less effective, then people, more suffer, people suffer from untreated bacterial infections, which means more people become really sick or maybe even die. And also it means we need to spend more money and resources into developing new drugs because the old drugs have become less effective. Right? So this is basically some of the problems and some of the arguments for those problems. I hope that was useful.